Amen. Amen. What a beautiful anthem. Thank you so much today. Uh, sing Wayne Boyd there singing in the back row. Uh, the choir reminds me uh, that our beautiful flowers today are given uh, to the glory of God and in honor and celebration of Wayne and Ellie's 56th wedding anniversary. And he's Today, be sure to give them a word of love and celebration for that. Our scripture reading today does come from the same uh, story that I was telling the children today, the story of Micah. This picks up about halfway through his story as the robbers are coming uh, into his home. This is Judges chapter 18, verses 18 through 26. When the men went into Micah's house and took the idol and cast metal, the ephod and the teraphim and the priests said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hands over your mouth, and come with us, and be to us a father and a priest. It is better for you to be a priest to the house of one person, or the priest to a whole tribe and clan in Israel. Then the priest accepted the offer. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the idol, and he went with them and their people. So they resumed their journey, putting the little ones, the livestock, and the goods in front of them. And when they had gone some distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the house of Micah called out. And they ran after the men, and they overtook the Danites. And they shouted to the Danites, who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter that you come in such a company? And Micah replied, You, take, you have taken my gods, and you have taken my priests, and you go away. And what do I have left? How then can you ask me, what is the matter? And the Danites said to him, You had better not let your voice be heard among us, or some hot-tempered fellows will attack you, and you will lose your life and the lives of your household. Then the Danites went their way. And Micah saw that they were too strong for him, and he turned back, and he went back to his home. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Well, here is another uh, exciting story from the book of Judges, which is really just one exciting story after another. Here's a particular story about one man whose name was Micah. And we do give Micah a lot of credit. I admire him. He starts out in the story with the very best of intentions, and I always like people like that because that's how I always start out in my stories that don't always turn out well. I start out with the best of intentions. Michael wanted to have, we feel close to God. He wanted to have a faith uh, that was strong. And he believed that one way to do that was to set up a church in his house. And so he did that. He got the place for it. He got the things that he needed to put all around. He even found a priest, a Levite, from the tribe of Levi. They were supposed to be the priests. And he found a Levite to be there to be his priest. But one day he was away from home, and these Danites, now the Danites, uh, that's from people from the tribe of Dan. They were really his own people. They were Jewish people. But they were out looking for a new land, a new place where they could settle. And one thing they thought is as they were settling, gosh, we need, a, we need a place to worship. And some advanced scouts had seen Micah's nice little setup there with his little church. And so they came specifically to take his church away. And in the process, they even convinced the minister uh, to go along with them. So Micah had a sad homecoming when he got back. He saw that his church had been taken away from him. And he follows the Danites. He's so upset that he realizes once he gets there, they're a big army. He's just got his few guys from his household. But he says something that I always remember. You take away my gods with you. And my priest, what do I have left? You take away my gods and my priest, what do I have left? Well, Micah does become, in the course of his story, the man whose faith was stolen. His religion was stolen, and it points out something important to us today. Because we have and can have today, very easily, the kind of faith that can be stolen, can be taken away. It's possible to do, to have a faith that is stronger than that, that is so strong, that is so firm, it cannot be taken away. Let's take a look at this story of Micah and see what it was about his faith that enabled it to be a faith that could be stolen. Well, the first thing we can say is, is 
Because Micah wasn't there with his church. He wasn't there with his minister. It, we could say, possibly, that he was neglecting them. And that's one reason they were taken away. He wasn't there to protect them, to look after them. His faith was, we could say, a neglected faith. And there's no better way to get something taken away from you, one way or another, than to neglect it. A neglected faith, yes, it can be taken away. And so it's true of many things in life. We have a few, a list of things like this that come up in our household from time to time. Things we lose because they were neglected. We don't need them for a long time, and then suddenly we absolutely need them. And where are they? We cannot find them. Things like uh, immunization records for the kids, or uh, birth certificates uh, for the kids. Things like that, some record that we need, and suddenly it's important, and we cannot find it. Where is it? Which file is it in? We don't know because it has been neglected, and so it has been taken from us. This neglect has the power to take so many of the best things of life. Really, the greatest gifts that God gives us, neglect can take them away. If you own your own business, this is certainly true, you don't need to commit some felony to lose your business, commit some great crime or some notable action. No, all you need to do is to neglect your business, and it will go away. The same way, the same is true of every job. We do not need to commit some terrible act at our job in order to lose it. We simply need to neglect our job. And over the course of time, it will be gone. The same is true of the most important relationships in our lives. You have some close friendship. You don't need a big act of betrayal to end that friendship. You simply neglect it. And it will be stolen from you. It will be taken away. And so it's true of Relationships, our spouses, parents, our children, the very closest relationships in life, all of them require our attention. And it is so easy in this day and age to neglect relationships. Oh yes, they will be taken away. And so will our faith. So can our faith if we begin to neglect it. It's easy for us, I believe, in this day and age to be a lot like Micah was. To believe that we can, what we need to have faith and what we need to have a, a meaningful relationship with God is from a list of things that we have to check off. Let's see, do we have our Bible? And is it right where we want it to be, up on the shelf or out on the table? We have the cross that we like to look at as we bow in prayer. We have a church that worships every Sunday. Folks are here every Sunday. Those are all good things, and I think they should be on everybody's list of things that we should have for our faith. But then when we start neglecting them, when we quit opening the Bible, when we quit bowing in prayer, when we quit coming to worship, how easy it is when the moment comes when our faith is needed, when something arises and we turn to God and suddenly we realize it has been simply neglected for too long. We need to make sure our faith is one of those things in our lives that is so easy to neglect because like Micah's little church, it can be taken away. There's another reason his faith was so easily taken from him. It wasn't simply the fact that he wasn't there to protect it. He wasn't paying attention to it. It's also because it was for him a man-made faith. And we see this as we read his story. The things I was talking about, I was talking to the kids about what things do we need, and they were talking about the table, the bread, the cross. Well, the things that Micah had were, well, they were nice things. I kind of think about our cross here and how beautiful it is and how much we, we love seeing it here on Sunday. Well, Micah had a beautiful thing that he had created out of 200 pieces of silver, an ephod it was called. And it was a thing that was, so, like our cross, was supposed to remind him uh, of God and of God's presence, but at some point it crossed the line for him, and it became itself a God that could be taken away. Remember what he said, you have taken away my gods. He had something that was man-made, and his faith was man-made, and certainly that is the kind of faith that can be taken from us. Now, this is an issue that comes up all the time for us, Today, I think it's come up every, every age. 
We go through life and we have a certain worldview and we have certain opinions about things. And we try to take our faith then and, and fit it into our worldview. Instead of having our faith come first, I, this came up the other day, I was listening uh, to the radio and I heard somebody say uh, on the radio, well, God, Jesus taught us that God helps those who help themselves. And I thought, no, he didn't. Jesus never said that. In fact, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. Now, that fits our worldview. It fits my worldview in, in many ways. But it's not a part of the gospel. In fact, the gospel says God helps us despite the fact we don't help ourselves. God gives us his grace and his forgiveness. And Jesus didn't come and come to those who he could then help to help themselves. He came to people who were, for one reason or another, helpless. And he helped them despite the fact that they couldn't or they wouldn't help themselves. It's easy for us to have a man-made religion that has some belief that can be found anywhere in the Bible, and yet we like to think it's there. We want to believe that it's there. There was a little story about a preacher in uh, London back, back during the Blitz. The, the Nazis were raining bombs down on London. And he visited one little lady in his parish who had survived a, a, a closeness. It was very close. In fact, the bombs had hit the next neighborhood over, had leveled all the buildings. And he was talking to her about this, and he found out that she had an interesting theory about how why this happened and how God allowed it. She said, to the minister, you know, I just knew those bombs were heading for me, and so I sat and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed those bombs to go past me and onto the next block. And the minister said, Wow, well, that's a little rough on the next block, wasn't it? I, a little hard on them. Is that a loving thing to do? And she said, Oh, no, it's, it's fine because if they had been praying, they could have prayed the bombs on out into the river. Now, where did she get that idea in the Bible? It's not their little man-made idea that she has about God. And so what does she think if the time ever does come that she's praying for something not to happen? And it does. You see, her faith will be taken away from her. But she is built on a man-made basis. Instead of on the gospel, on the good news, what did Jesus come to tell us? Did he come to give us a big set of rules to follow? No. Jesus came to tell us about the unimaginable love of God and how we should be loving people too. Love others in unimaginable and extremely difficult ways. And that's the gospel, part of it at least. That's one thing God has come to tell us. And so, gosh, I, as we think about our faith and keeping our faith burglar-proof, that is a burglar-proof faith right there. Because it is based on the gospel. Michael's faith got carried away because it was man-made. But there's one last reason that Michael's faith got carried away. And it's really that it was just, as we think about faith, it was all external to it. It wasn't something he seemed to carry in his heart. Again, you listen to him and you hear him say, you have stolen my gods. What do I have left? His faith were these, these things. And they, it wasn't in his heart. I've been reading recently, and Alan Schwillings really has been joining me too, and reading about um, this generation called the Millennials. Any of you here who were born after 1980 are part of the generation called Millennials. The question was, what do Millennials want from church? What do they want from worship? And the answer that we have been reading is that they want worship to be authentic. Authentic worship. And I thought, well, don't we all? Isn't that something all of us want worship to be authentic? And I think that was probably part of the problem with my gut. It just wasn't authentic. It wasn't something he carried in his heart. It wasn't something that changed him, that motivated him, that 
got him going and got him acting in new and, and, and good and godly ways. It's one of the dangers we have of having a beautiful sanctuary to worship in, a wonderful music program, a great choir, talented musicians, a church staff to lead us in worship. It's easy for us to start thinking, it's always a temptation, at least for me, to start thinking of worship as lots of other things and we put them all together and then we have worship. No, it's more than that. It's more than that, and it is sometimes hard to get at. What is authentic worship? Well, I like the story of one minister. He was a great evangelist, actually, but back in the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, E. Stanley Jones was his name, and he talked about the first time he ever preached in his home church. And I, as a preacher, I love this story. It was so relatable. He came, and he was a young student at that time, wanting to be a minister and feeling that calling to ministry. And so he was going to his home church to preach for the first time. And he had some important point he wanted to make. And he knew he would have to back it up with scripture. And he was very careful prepared. He wanted it all to make sense, to go from one point to the next. He wanted to change people. And he wanted people to be impressed. These people he'd known since childhood, impressed with his preaching. And so he stood up, so well prepared, and stood up in the pulpit just as I'm standing here today. And he started preaching, and he got about 12 sentences into his sermon when he used a word that he had never used before and hadn't used ever after. He had made it up in his mind in that moment. The word he had used was indifferentism. Indifferentism, and he said it, and he realized that's not a real word. And he looked out, and he saw some young people that were also in college and he saw them smile. And he knew they knew it wasn't a word, too, and that they were smiling, and he realized all this work he put into impressed people. That wasn't working. What's going to happen? And he started thinking about it, getting so nervous, he forgot what to say next. He forgot what came next in his whole sermon. The whole thing broke down and left his head. And he stood in the pool and looked out. He was wringing his hands. Finally, he said, I've forgotten my sermon. I'm sorry. And he turned around and he started walking down the steps. And he got almost to the bottom step. And he heard or he felt or he sensed God's voice in his, in his head saying, have I done nothing for you? And in his mind, he said to God, yes, you've done everything for me. And God said, well, just tell them that. And so he stopped at the bottom step and he walked to the front of the pulpit. And he said, friends, clearly I cannot preach. But I love Jesus Christ. You have known me. You know what a wild and selfish young man I used to be. And you know how I am today. God, through his son Jesus Christ, has created a new life for me. And I may not be able to preach, but I love Jesus Christ, and I want to serve him. And there at that moment, he learned something that many ministers never get a chance to learn. He learned that it's not how, ever how well prepared you are, though being prepared always helps. It's what you have in your heart. It's what you want to convey and what you feel called to convey to others, this life-changing love of God. Well, Michael's faith was taken away from him, maybe because it was neglected, perhaps because it was man-made, or that it wasn't authentic enough. But what about our faith, yours and mine here today? Well, maybe it would benefit us each day, we make sure we look in our hearts and we make sure our faith is still there, still strong, and still making a difference in our lives, in the lives of those around us. Let us bow in prayer. Loving God, Thank you for your many blessings in our lives, Lord. 
help us keep a 